as Chris was saying, I'm a consultant in intensive care medicine at Hammersmith, but I also do research across the whole of Imperial, and uh, currently I'm president of the Intensive Care Society. So what I thought I'd do with you is, is share some of uh, our experience of what happens to people after a period of critical illness, and uh, perhaps we'll have some time to discuss things, and then Jez is, is going to talk through a little bit about what we're attempting to do in, in northwest London. I thought I'd start with this picture. So this is a picture by the Victorian artist Luke Files, who painted this picture in tribute to the physician who looked after his own child who sadly died during the course of an illness. And superficially, it looks like a gloomy picture. We see it's dark, there's an ill child in the middle. We see the physician hunched over the child's figure and two parents in the background by the window obviously looking very concerned. But I like to see it as an optimistic image and uh, perhaps the light of dawn is shining on the child and maybe the fever's broken and this is the start of recovery. Now, up until about 20 odd years ago, in intensive care, we used to wave people out of the back door of the intensive care unit thinking we'd done a great job and that from then on it was, uh, it was a rapid uh, road to, uh, to full health and functional recovery. And uh, then we started to do some more detailed work on this and we've discovered that actually for many people, leaving the intensive care unit isn't the end of a thing, it's actually the start of a thing. Um, so I'm going to share with you some thoughts on that and uh, some of this I think will resonate with the work that you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. I thought I'd start with a case. So this is Susan. So Susan came to us at Hammersmith Hospital eventually. So she was unwell in the community uh, with symptoms of respiratory tract infection. And uh, she popped along to see her GP, who prescribed a dose of uh, a few days of uh, amoxicillin, at perhaps a slightly parsimonious dose. But anyway, it didn't get any better. Uh, she'd had previous bronchitis. She'd had an endoscopy, smoked a bit, lived with her family, and uh, part of a um, major part of her family was that she spent a lot of time looking after her grandchild for her daughter who worked. And on the face of it, it seemed like a very, uh, a very nuclear, caring family, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But anyway, she ended up at Hammersmith Hospital, not very well, uh, with the uh, signs of developing pneumonia, and some of the lab tests suggested that she really wasn't well at all. And you can see her platelet count has fallen, and her albumin has fallen, and uh, the CRP, uh, which is a thing we used to, as a marker of inflammation, is, uh, is very, very high indeed. And she had sort of standard treatment, and um, it, by day five, she was no better, and she ended up in the intensive care unit. And uh, you can see on her chest X-ray a nasty-looking shadow in the right upper zone, uh, which, which is her pneumonia. And perhaps you can see right at the top of that already the makings of a cavity. And it turned out eventually that this was due to strep pneumonia. And the CT scan that we did on her showed this developing cavity and a very nasty lung injury, I think you'd all agree. And, um, and she was with us for a while. In fact, she was with us for about 10 days and a further nine days in hospital. And eventually off she went. And um, even though she looked as though she'd been fixed, she still had this nasty hole in her right lung, which required continued treatment because from time to time she was coughing up blood. Anyway, that was her x-ray as she left the hospital. And you can see that it's still not normal, although the CT scan looks much worse than the x-ray. So. She was seen by respiratory medicine, and uh, they were reasonably happy with her physical recovery, uh, but they were very unhappy with how she seemed to be progressing psychologically, and they sent her back to my outpatient clinic, my intensive care medicine follow-up clinic, as a matter of urgency, and they twigged that she, she was having these nightmares and this severe anxiety. And I saw her, and there were a number of things that struck me. First off, that she had lost a lot of her energy and vitality. She remembered virtually nothing about her time in intensive care other than a nasty collection of delusional memories and very little of what actually really happened to her. She was having nightmares and perhaps surprisingly she'd become completely isolated within her family. She was desperate to try and fill in this black hole that she had but her family had been so traumatized by sitting at her bedside as they perceived her to be close to death that they just didn't want to go there again. They, for, as far as they were concerned, they'd drawn a line under it and it was time to move on. And she was, of course, desperate to work out why she felt so terrible and what she might do about it and what had happened to her. And uh, not surprisingly, she was extremely anxious. 
So I spent a little bit of, well, I spent a long time with her. We, we went up back up to the intensive care unit and we tried to fill in some gaps for her and um, explain where all these delusions and nightmares might have come from. And seven months later, just with simple uh, explanation of what had happened to her and perhaps a bit of what we might call normalisation, she was doing a lot better. And although she was still having some symptoms, now that she knew that she wasn't alone and that uh, many, many people have similar uh, sets of symptoms. She felt much better about life and in fact was planning to go away on holiday. So it was a positive thing for her. But of course if she hadn't accidentally ended up in our intensive care follow-up clinic there would have been no one to tell her what to expect and we still don't have an organised system to tell people what to expect once they uh, get on the pathway out of the hospital. Now if we look at this diagram here we can see uh, what happened to a cohort of people who were discharged from hospital in northeast Scotland? This was a study done by Brian Cuthbertson and uh, when he was professor of critical care up in Aberdeen. Now, if we look at this line here, we can see the accumulating quality of life of patients who've been in critical illness. So these are qualies, accumulating quality adjusted life years using the EQ5D methodology, which I think you're probably all familiar with. And uh, what we can see is that the, the ITU survivors are accumulating quality of life at a much slower rate than the age and sex match population, which you can see in the dashed line. And they accumulate qualities at a rate of almost one a year. Why it's not exactly one a year in North East Scotland, I'm not sure, but nevertheless it's not. It's almost one a year. And then the ITU survivor population are doing much worse. Uh, so why might that be? Well, when we talk to patients in our follow-up clinics, these are the sort of things which are important to people. So this is a sort of spoof Venn diagram, but of course the individual domains on the Venn diagram are in fact very individual. So some people may have persisting pain, a lot of people. Some people will have cognitive impairment, affective disorders, some of them will remember nothing, some of them will remember horrible things. And then this thing on the bottom right, perceived change in health, is very important because in many ways that's the prism through which people regard their recovery. And you can imagine that if you're a 19-year-old and you break your leg coming off your scooter or, or your bike, then that's always going to be a major negative experience. Whereas if you're an 85-year-old, then you go into hospital and you have, say, an aortic valve replacement because your life has been dominated by chest pain and breathlessness, then maybe a couple of weeks recovering slowly in intensive care isn't such a bad thing. And you get home, and you might be a bit weaker, but your life is no longer dominated by chest pain and breathlessness, so it can be a good thing. So they, they would view their experiences of critical care very differently. Now, there is... There are reports of people who experience this construct which you guys will be very familiar with called psychological growth. So occasionally you'll see people who've been through a horror and somehow they've come out the other side stronger. And I, I met one of these individuals a few weeks ago in clinic who'd, uh, who was a young man who'd had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in Ealing and he ended up in Ealing Hospital and he distinctly remembers experiencing cardiac massage. And um, he'd been sent again back to see me early because there were anxieties that he'd been aware of what was going on with him. And, and he remembers distinctly people talking around him about how he must be aware of what's going on because at that stage they hadn't given him any sedative drugs. And he distinctly remembers an enormous man doing uh, cardiac massage. Um, and he was incredibly philosophical about this because he recognised that the guy who was doing the cardiac mass massage had been doing a great job and that without him, he would have been dead. And the fact that he was a 32-year-old who just had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest really had made him reevaluate what was important about his life. So for him, actually, oddly, he'd come through the whole thing as a slightly different but much more positive individual. So it is very, very complicated, nevertheless. People remember all sorts of stuff from their time in intensive care, and often it's weird and they don't expect it to be weird and sometimes it can be awkward. So the most common delusional memory is the homicidal nurse. If we talk to people up and down the country it's always this. And we expect our nursing colleagues to do very unpleasant and uncomfortable things to patients and sometimes their, their minds play tricks on them and these things get uh, into a, a complicated delusion. But other stuff that's apparently happened is drug dealing in Hammersmith Hospital. 
trips to the bar. We've never had a band, as far as I'm aware. One fellow woke up in one of our glass isolation wards, and, uh, and he thought, because the combination of the glass and these small, unrecognisable brown figures that were wandering around his bed, uh, that he'd been abducted by aliens. And then as his conscious level improved somewhat, he recognised that they were, in fact, my Filipino nursing colleagues, many of whom are not that tall. And he was really quite disappointed um, that he was still next to Wormwood Scrubs Prison and not on the way to, uh, to Alpha Centauri. And then the last one I've listed is a, a guy whose family came from a Central European Jewish background, and the senior part of his family had all died in the Holocaust during the last war. And he'd never met any of them, but he'd seen pictures of them at, uh, in sort of family photograph albums. And he met these people in our intensive care unit. And his delusion had been this family that died that he'd never met before. And they were all together in a queue waiting to be thrown through the door of a furnace, which, as you can imagine, is an incredibly distressing thing to experience. And I didn't even know that this type of thing was possible. And he recognised that it was a delusional thing, uh, but it made it no less distressing for him. So all sorts of very odd things. And, and what patients describe are not things which they've experienced which have any sort of dreamlike quality. We all know what a dream feels like when we're briefly re-experiencing it. These things seem to be stored by the brain with the wrong label on. So they seem very much like a memory of an actual event. And of course, they keep coming back, which dreams tend not to. So these are the sorts of things that can actually build into a construct which can contribute to the development of post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'll come back to. So what about physical issues? And bearing in mind that physical and mental health are intimately uh, entwined. This is a study from Canada where they looked at a number of people who'd survived the most severest form of respiratory failure. And what we can see here at discharge is they left the hospital minus almost 20% of their body weight. And over the course of a year, that recovered somewhat, but it tends not to be skeletal muscle that recovers. So these people have left in the hospital a lot of useful muscle, and that's reflected in their six-minute walk test, which is a standard respiratory function test. And you can see at the top here the median six-minute walk thing, if I can do this without waggling the slides around. So 280 metres, which isn't very far in six minutes if you're really pushing it. And by 12 months, they'd recovered a bit to 400 metres. This is a young group of people. So this particular cohort that surviving this severe respiratory um, failure, a young group uh, who are physically uh, very, very impaired com compared to what they'd expect to be. Now, we know a little bit about what goes on. This is a study from uh, Guys and Thomases and the Whittington Hospital published in JAMA uh, a few months ago. And it looks at the loss of muscle of, that these individuals experience. And these guys did biopsies in intensive care patients and they assessed muscular size using ultrasound. And what they found um, was that people lose between 1% to 2% of their skeletal muscle every day for the first 10 days in an intensive care unit. And it's related math mathematically to the numbers of organs that are failing. So what we see in this slide here, if you look at the top right panel, that's an HE stain across a muscle biopsy. And that just looks like mush, doesn't it? The, the panel next to it, the top left panel, uh, is, is, the, is a biopsy taken much earlier during the course of critical illness. So what we see is a progressive deterioration of muscle, and uh, not surprisingly, it doesn't work very well when we're trying to help people recover. So physical degradation is very, very important. And to some extent, it's related to the number of organ systems that have failed. So people in multiple organ failure tend to lose much more skeletal muscle than those people that have only got one or two organs that are failing. So this is really important, and it's, it does impair functional recovery a lot. Now, when I, when I started my follow-up clinic some 16 years ago, these were the sorts of things that I took from people that were talking to me. Many of them complained of problems with their memory, struggling with com concentration for a number of months after le leaving the ITU, and many of them found that the simple sort of mental tasks which they'd uh, previously not struggled with, they were, really were struggling quite substantially with. And uh, this was my definition of cognitive function. Memory, attention, linguistics, 
and this thing called executive function, which at the time I'd not really encountered before, but in, in simple terms, to me, means the ability to take in information, to process it, to follow rules and to make decisions. And most of us do this completely unconsciously, uh, but for some of our ITU patients in survival, then they struggle a lot. We've got quite a lot of data on this now. This is a study from, again, severe respiratory, uh, respiratory impairment. And Mona Hopkins, who was the first author on this study, was an ITU nurse before she retrained as a, as a PhD neuropsychologist. And in her group of people at a year, um, she found that almost all of them had evidence of cognitive impairment. And almost all of them also had evidence of an affective disorder of anxiety and depression. Um, and that the, the people who had the worst cognitive impairment also had the worst burden of anxiety and depression. And that was reflected in general quality of life. These data are from a two-year study, which she did on the same group of people, and they're from the SF36, uh, which is a generic quality of life instrument, which scores people's domains of life from left to right, physical function, role, physical, bodily pain, general health, vitality, social function, role, emotional, and mental health. And the little diamonds at the bottom um, are uh, when people left the hospital, uh, the triangles are at one year and the circles are at two years after, after discharge. And the squares at the top are the, an age, sex and educational level normal range for the North American population. So these guys are struggling to get back to what one would expect. And, uh, and not surprisingly, that presents all sorts of difficulties. So that was a severe respiratory failure population. This study from Vanderbilt is actually from a general intensive care population, and it was conducted by a bunch of people which included some people who were experts in the mental health of the elderly. And uh, they looked at a large number of people originally, but what you can see is that eventually they only got detailed data of 34 patients, which gives us an important point here in that quite often in the intensive care follow-up literature, your final reported sample is often a fraction of your original sample. And th therefore, one must be a little bit cautious about over-interpreting these small sample studies. And also, of course, in an ITU follow-up clinic-based study, there may be all sorts of reasons why one individual shows up where another doesn't. So some people may be back at work, others may have such terrible PTSD that they never want to go near a general hospital again. And, uh, but, but in these little projects, you never quite know what the biases were. So they looked at people six months after discharge, and they did extensive neuropsychological testing. And they ended up concluding that a third of these people ha had significant levels of cognitive impairment. And they recognized these levels of impairment as the same sort of thing they were seeing in mild to moderate dementia, but 10 to 20 years earlier. And the only thing that seemed to help was that those people who had a higher level of prior educational attainment seemed to be more resilient to this than those people that had failed to, uh, to get out of, uh, out of high school with a, with a graduation certificate. They did this sort of study. This is the Ray Osterreith complex figure, which some of you may have seen before. So you give the person the picture in the top left, and you ask them to copy it, and then you can grade function based on how accurately people re can, can reproduce it. So it's quite an interesting test to have a go at yourself. These are some data from a study we did at Hammersmith Hospital. Um, we looked at, we were particularly interested in executive function, so we did a number of tests. T1 is three months after ITU discharge, T2 is nine months, and the tests that we used all gave an output of individuals against a population percentile equivalent. Um, so the, we did Raven's progressive matrices, which is this type of thing that we get all our kids to do. Um, Hailing is the Hailing sentence completion test, and the SET is a six-element test, both of which are tests of executive function. And you can see, I think, that there's generally a clustering of low level of performance with some recovery by nine months, but it's not very impressive. So this was a random bunch of patients who are struggling with, to complete fairly objective tests of cognitive function. Again, another caveat about the data. Of course, the people who establish the normal range for many of these tests are not necessarily the same sort of people that come into an intensive care unit. 
So although most of these tests have normal normative data associated with them, uh, they're all normal data from a bunch of people who had nothing better to do than to go into a local psychology department one afternoon and sit there as a normal subject. So they may not necessarily be true normals, but it's the best we have. So it's a confusing literature, but if you put it all together, as we did, uh, Mona Hopkins and I did some years ago, you can see there's a general sense that somewhere between 20 and 30% of people in follow-up based studies seem to have significant levels of cognitive impairment. And if you talk to ITU survivors, I think you'd recognize that. Now, delirium is a big issue for us. And we don't have a bunch of drugs which we're really proud of to help us manage it. Quite a lot of the things that we do to patients probably contribute to it. Patients hate it. It terrifies them. Families hate it. It terrifies them as well. When we recently ran a priority setting exercise for research in a, what's called a James Lind Alliance project where we brought together the whole of our community plus patients and their families, um, this was one of the priorities. The delirium thing is, is a huge issue. Now, what it seems is that people who have episodes of delirium during their critical illness are far more likely to have longer term significant cognitive impairment leaving aside the fact that delirium is associated with a worse mortality outcome, so people who are delirious are less likely to get out of the hospital alive. And we don't fully understand this. We know that some of the drugs that we use are more likely to be associated with delirium. Some of the drugs we use to treat it we don't like at all, and in fact some of them have recently lost their license. So haloperidol, for example, which is used a lot, actually no longer has a UK license to, in this particular indication, and in fact is almost unavailable at the moment because of a manufacturing problem. So people are starting to explore using newer um, sedative agents, uh, but it is an issue. Um, this study looked actually at the relationship between delirium and, and cognitive impairment, but the, if we look on this graph here, over to the right, we can see that um, in the older group, they're measuring levels of cognitive function, which is not that dissimilar to people who have Alzheimer's disease, but this is earlier. So it's, an, it's, an, it's a problem. And there's a, this, as I said, this relationship between the days that people are delirious and future cognitive function, it doesn't do people's brains any good. And we don't really know why. People are beginning to study this. This is an autopsy study which showed that in patients who'd been delirious, there, were, um, there was significant evidence of scattered <coughs> hypoxic ischemic damage, which is hard to interpret given that these are post-mortem studies and quite a lot of early post-mortem autolysis occurs, so not sure about this one. Then now, we've now got some studies using, using complex neuroimaging. This is um, using PET scanning and also some biomarker studies, and this is seeming to suggest there are two competing possibilities for pathology. One is neuroinflammation or gliosis, which we can investigate using a PET scanner, but the necessary ligands for this are fearsomely expensive. It's about eight to nine thousand pounds per patient to do this sort of investigation. So it, it's really tricky. Um, and the biomarker studies are, are less expensive and, and some of them are beginning to suggest that possibly we see the sort of processes that are associated with Alzheimer type dementia but again, as I said, occurring decades earlier than one might anticipate it. So whether that's because it's precipitating dementia in people who would have got that anyway, or whether it's an in independent factor, is not yet known. And uh, we're hoping that we can unpick this as, th as the years go on. I want to talk a bit about other problems that people have. This is the same bunch of people I showed earlier on. Uh, this is using the hospital anxiety and depression scale. And um, again, three and nine months after intensive care discharge, and anybody over the dashed line is at a level that the uh, test developers would have defined as a case of anxiety and depression. So this is quite common, and it seems quite stable. So those people who are anxious early remain anxious, and those people that are depressed early also remain <coughs> depressed, uh, which is a slightly concerning thing. None of these people had any interventions for any of this because at the time there weren't really services set up to deal with it and in fact in, in many places there simply aren't either. Post-traumatic stress disorder is increasingly recognised as a possible consequence of critical illness and they've recently adjusted the coding so that we can now include prior critical care as a precipitating factor. 
The literature is difficult because, again, much of it was based in follow-up clinic studies, and you, you can see here in the systematic review a huge range in uh, possible reported incidents of, of PTSD, ranging from, well, anything from naught up to 60-odd percent. A much better study was done by Dorothy Wade in UCL, which is virtually above our heads here, and she recruited patients on the intensive care unit and developed a relationship with them and then actually followed them out in recovery. And because she'd established that earlier relationship with them, her dropout rate was almost nil. So her data, I think, are inherently more reliable. And what she found in her population was that about, well, slightly over a half had almost certain psychological morbidity. So a quarter of them, she was felt, had definite evidence of post-traumatic stress disorder, and about a half of them had a diagnosable anxiety or depressive state. So for people who have appreciable episodes of critical illness, this is a potential issue. Loads of people go to ITU just for sort of bed and breakfast after major surgery, but for those that stay for longer than a couple of days, this is a major future issue that we don't actually know enough about or capture properly. So I showed you Margaret Herridge's study from Toronto from her uh, first year of follow-up. These are the same group of people five years later. So what we're trying to do is work out when people peak in terms of their recovery. And uh, again, the six-minute walk test, you can see right at the top there. So at a year, it's 420 metres, and at five years, they can do marginally more. And then the SF36, this quality of life instrument, is showing some sense of recovery. And um, if we look at this broken out into the mental component score and the physical component score, we can see in the panel on the right that the mental component recovery looks to be significantly earlier than physical recovery in this particular group of people. So when you're faced with somebody in clinic and they say, Doc, how long is it going to take me to get better? Well, physically, they will continue to recover maybe for a couple of years. I'll come back to that right at the end. But, but people can expect to be recovering for t a couple of years. And their sort of mental state may peak, their recovery may peak a bit earlier than that. But we don't really know this properly. But it's a long time to recover. And of course, if, num if people aren't telling you how long it's going to take to recover, then that's very unsettling. And I often see very young, high-performing individuals who are getting into a cycle of frustration and, uh, to use a my sort of language into a depressed state because they're not hitting the goals that they've set for themselves. So they expect to be back at the gym six weeks later or back running a half marathon or doing whatever it was they were doing before. And often they set themselves a series of unachievable goals. And sure, we want to push people so that they recover as much as they can, but they need permission to recover at the rate that's sensible for them. And lots of high-achieving individuals set themselves unachievable goals because nobody's told them what they should expect and this is a failing in our services which Jez is going to explore with you in, in a moment. So what can we conclude? Well in terms of non-physical aspects to health, sure depression, anxiety, PTSD are definite issues and we're uncertain as to the magnitude of, of the relationship with acute illness. Now, what I find, when I, my clinic's on a Friday afternoon, and I find that uh, I, it's Friday afternoon because when I set the thing up, for some reason, there were loads of vacant clinic rooms on a Friday afternoon, so that I didn't have much of a battle to get one. If I really worried about somebody, then I phone up their GP that day, and in northwest London, I get a sort of mixed response. Some people haven't a clue what I'm talking about. Well, some of them aren't there anymore. Some haven't a clue what I'm talking about. And other people say, fine, I'll see them in Monday. on Monday. We have a proper plan for this. We have a link in with local mental health. And the whole thing seems to work in a very different way. So what can we conclude from that? Well, certainly in northwest London, there's an incredibly patchy provision of service for people who have non-physical consequences of critical illness. And, and that's the sort of thing that you guys might become uh, involved with we, we would hope. Physically, people can have almost anything wrong with them. The, the thing that's a bit frustrating from my point of view is often because people don't understand what individuals have been through in intensive care, then 
their primary care physicians often misdiagnose the problems that they have. And we're forever having people uh, who are being misdiagnosed as having asthma or they're reacting badly to their heart failure medication when actually what they've got is damage to their trachea and they need a little bit of laser treatment to their trachea which will sort it all out. And sometimes people have their drugs altered in, a, in, in the wrong way. Uh, but often people have a loss of physical um, confidence and some of our the patient groups that we work with they they describe this feeling as particularly in people who've had a m medical disease rather than trauma as they've lost confidence in their body that in in some ways their body has let them down and that loss of confidence in, in is can be really important for some individuals and uh, we might explore that if we have time a little a little bit later now when these people get home often they need a lot of help and the provision of that help is very patchy. So this is a study from North America um, which looked at what happened to people who become informal caregivers and perhaps not surprisingly all, the majority of these individuals are female and they themselves begin to take a hit on their own physical and mental health and, uh, and there's disruption to their lifestyle and their employment and we knew nothing about what this looked like in the United Kingdom uh, until relatively recently. But studies from North America suggested that if you were a family and you receive home the survivor of a major illness, then often a th in a third of families, another adult will leave the workforce for a prolonged period of time. And in a third of families, they will lose all of their savings. Now, we had no clue about this in the UK. And then with colleagues in Oxford and with a network which we'd set up throughout the United Kingdom, we performed this, um, this follow-up study of people who were enrolled at the time when they left the intensive care units of hospitals all over the place. And what we see on this slide, the, in, this, uh, in this histogram, the dark lines are what, was, what people were like before they got into the intensive care unit, so their pre-morbid state, and then at six months and 12 months in the two lighter grey bars. And we can see that a lot of people seem to transition from the uh, employed category to state support in follow-up. So lots of people have a prolonged period of, um, uh, of unemployment where they actually move from this bar here over here. So there's a long tail of people being less economically active and their families lose money. So these are, the, these are the income bands that the Office of National Statistics use and these are changes in income band and you can see here there's a general left shifting of family security and uh, that obviously can feed into all sorts of things. These are the people who become informal caregivers. So the mi minority of people actually have no change. Most people have to leave work, reduce their hours, change job, or give up work altogether. So this is a big thing, because obviously family security, financial and social, has a major bearing on how people recover. So we do have continuing uncertainty. First off, we're still, I talked about the enrolment bias in studies where people end up in ITU follow-up clinics. We don't really know the true impact of that. We're still not sure about this plateau at five years. What a lot of patients tell us is that actually, once you leave, once you become an ITU survivor, then for many of them, that's it for good. They always feel that they are a critical illness survivor and that people have started talking about this concept of survivorship and that somehow the rest of their life is lived as an ITU survivor. So these are people who've been in there for appreciable periods of time. The whole issue of the muscle, oops, sorry, of um, muscle loss and systemic inflammation, uh, we don't fully understand. Uh, and the social and economic impact, we're just beginning to, we're beginning to unpick. Now, just in the last few slides, this is a pictorial way of describing people's functional recovery uh, in the intensive care unit. So people are scored against these particular objective functional assessments and then as they get better then hopefully this red line begins to fill the spidergram thing here. Now when people leave the intensive care unit their status on this particular tool actually predicts where they go after they leave hospital. So depending upon their CPAX as it's called score then if they do well then they go home and then varying degrees of continuing support are needed. 
So we, all, we can almost predict who's going to go do badly when they leave the intensive care unit. Now, the final concept I, w I want to share with you is this concept of recovery trajectories. So although we like to think everybody's getting a lot better, and the, the fact is that from our sort of early 20s, most of us are on a steady sort of functional decline uh, for the rest of our lives. Now, if we have an acute critical illness, down we go. Our functional status drops a lot. I have to say, I think I would argue with some of this, but this is what the people tell us, that from, the, from your early 20s, it's all gently downhill. But, but if you have a critical illness, down you go. Now, if you recover well, you'd hope to get back to the same level of gentle decline. But, of course, many people don't. And they, their peak recovery is some way less. And those lines might diverge. Some people, if they've got an illness that we can't fix, so if somebody's got a cancer, for example, that we can't fix, then they are going to experience a progressive and accelerated decline. And then, of course, lots of people have these relapsing, remitting illnesses. And, of course, understanding the nature of these relapses and remissions is important because if we're planning interventions and follow-up studies, then we need to understand the biology of these things so that we know how to monitor them and, and how to help people and also how to plan uh, how we measure the impact of any sort of interventions. So what are we going to do now? Well, we have to identify better a population who can benefit from intense processes to, to rehabilitate them. We're still a bit uncertain as to how to put some of these things together and what we might put in uh, a rehabilitation or an interventional package. We need to understand our usual care, which is highly heterogeneous in different parts of the country. And, of course, we have to be able to monitor what we're doing. And currently, we're still struggling a bit to identify outcome measures which will track interventions. But it's been an interesting journey. And uh, working with people who've survived this um, is, is a real lesson. And I learned this very early when I started seeing people in my clinic because I thought I was going to see a load of people who were uh, on a fantastic recovery journey, and many of them weren't. And I've learned a great deal from talking to them. And often it's a very uncomfortable lesson that you learn. A, a good example to finish with was a man who'd had a complete pancreatectomy um, in our hospital at Hammersmith. And um, so he, by, by the, the surgeons had therefore made him into a diabetic because his pancreas was now in a yellow bag somewhere. And I saw him in the clinic and I said to him, how are you, how are you getting on with the diabetes? And he looked at me as if I was completely insane and I began to be a little bit worried and I said well you know those injections that you have a couple of times a day and he said oh you mean the things the wife gives me and I said yeah maybe and it then transpired that we would managed to send him home without telling him he was now a diabetic his wife who was a diabetic had recognized the symptoms of diabetes in her husband and was using her own insulin to treat his diabetes and had had he not had that particularly mental, agile spouse, then he would probably have died. And I, I find these things all the time. And it's, uh, it, you say, so you do learn a great deal talking to people. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention this morning.